This proof makes use of the double arrow rules, and it also introduces the bottom-up strategy for the double arrow, which I call two lines for double arrow. Let's jump in. Line 1 has an ampersand as its main connective. That's always good news. Let's break it up. We're going to get m arrow n on line 4. We'll get tilde j on line 5. That, of course, is one ampersand out, and it's done twice. We can check off line 1. Line 2, we notice, has a double arrow as its main connective. Well, that's great news. Just like an ampersand, you can immediately break up a double arrow. Of course, a double arrow breaks into two single arrows. If we look at the rule, we see that the double arrow breaks into two single arrows here. And the easy way to think about this is the first step is just to write the double arrow and replace the double arrow with a single arrow. So we get m double arrow n arrow j ampersand h. Of course, this double arrow inside the parentheses is its own thing. We can't touch that one because it's inside parentheses. We only ever work on main connectives. So that was the first step. Rewrite the formula, replace the double arrow with a single arrow. Second step is to flip it and rewrite it the other direction like this. M double arrow N. I'm trying to write kind of small because I know this proof is actually going to take up all the space I've got. So now I just justify both of these by two double arrow out and I will use the ditto marks just like I do when I'm doing ampersand out. And now I can check off line two. Okay, let's see if there's anything else to do. Line three, well I don't have an N for arrow out. On four, I don't have an M for arrow out, so I'm going to ignore those. Five is too short to be interesting. But now I get to line six. Arrow is the main connective. If I had M double arrow N on another line by itself, then I could write J and H. Do I have M double arrow N? Well, I hope you're noticing that lines three and four, those are the two single arrows which you can put together to build a double arrow. That, of course, is what double arrow in allows you to do. If you have sort of an X relationship between the antecedents and the consequence, you can build a double arrow. That's exactly what we've got here. M, N. I'm not trying to cross this off. I'm just trying to show the clear relationship there. So basically, line six is going to inspire us to build M double arrow in. The M double arrow N that I'm writing right now is not coming out of line 6. I'm building it using 3 and 4. And so I'm going to cite 3, 4 double arrow N as its justification. 6 was the inspiration. And in fact, when I just used a creative rule, double arrow N. You should never be creative unless you know exactly why you're doing it. But I know exactly why I'm doing it. It's because on line 9, I want to do the arrow out and get J and H. And so that's what I'll do. And that will be 6, 8, arrow out. Okay, well, let me check off some lines here. At this point in the class, it's usually okay to just read the lines right off of the justifications here and check them all off. We've worked on 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 8. I'll turn those into checks. And that just helps focus our attention. Well, 5, that's still uninteresting. 7, if I had J and H, then I could do arrow out. Oh, look, I have J and H. Well, notice, though, what would happen if I did the arrow out. I would get M double arrow N again. So there's really no reason to work on 7. Both 6 and 7 came from line 2. And quite frequently, when you break up a double arrow, you're going to end up with two lines, one of which probably isn't going to be useful. I could go ahead and check it off just so I don't pay any more attention to it. In fact, it looks like the only thing that I can do of any value at all is to break up J and H. Okay, well, 
that's an automatic rule, so I'll do it. And it says nine, 9 ampersand out is the justification. And I'll check that one off too. At this point, it's clear that I'm stuck at the top and it's time to go to the bottom. Now you might notice a rather interesting thing. Lines 5 and 10 are a contradiction. Right now we don't need a contradiction. I will show you a trick at the end of this video about how you could make this a shorter proof if you noticed that contradiction and knew how to make use of it. But at the moment we say, well, we're just stuck at the top and if, you know, if we're not going to try to be creative or sneaky, we just say, well, we're stuck at the top, there's nothing to do, so it's time to go to the bottom. And we identify the main connective. Since the main connective is at the bottom is a double arrow, that tells us we should use this strategy I call two lines for a double arrow. It's virtually identical for two lines for ampersand. In fact, if you remember that a double arrow is equivalent to an ampersand statement, it really just is two lines for ampersand. What are the two lines we want? Well, obviously, we need to prove R arrow H. So I'm going to put that in the middle of the space. And we also need to prove H arrow R. And so I'm going to write that at the bottom of the space. I'm breaking this up into two separate proofs. They don't have line numbers or justifications, but if I can prove both of these things, then I can use double arrow in and I'll be done. Okay, R arrow H has an arrow as its main connective. That means I'm going to have to make a box to prove it. Nice little box right above it, just like that. And in fact, this is going to be a very little box. It's going to have R at the top and H at the bottom. R itself is going to be a provisional assumption for arrow in. But notice this box is done as soon as it's made because all I need to do is take line 11 and do repetition. So 13 is going to be 11 R. And success! I just proved R arrow H. So on 14 I'm going to say 12 through 13 arrow in and I'm halfway done. I proved R arrow H, now let's prove H arrow R. Okay, so this is going to have another box. Because I know what this proof is going to look like, I've made this box a little larger and left myself more space. You never know that, so that's why we work with an eraser. H at the top, R at the bottom. This is a provisional assumption as always and it's for arrow in because we're trying to prove an arrow. And now I go back up to the top and look for things to do. Ah, could I do repetition on line 12? No, because of course this box here is off limits because we're working underneath it. Can never use a line inside a box to justify anything below it. Let's check off some other things if we can. Well, 12 and 13, that's just the box itself and I, we used 11, we could check that. So notice the only thing that's up here is the contradiction. But we still aren't in a situation where we need a contradiction. So I guess we should just say we're stuck at the top, it's time to go back to the bottom. Well, we have a single letter by itself. The bottom-up strategy for a single letter is to do tilde out. So we'll make another box above this it will have tilde R at the top and we'll be looking for a contradiction. Ah yes, finally now we need a contradiction. Line 16 is a PA for tilde out, tilde out, and all we have to do is get a contradiction, but of course we've noticed it up here. Let's just put them together. 5, 10, ampersand in would give us J ampersand tilde J. 5, comma, 10, ampersand in. And now we're actually done with the proof. We're going to have to just write some justifications for 18, 19, and 20. 18, of course, is justified by the little box right above it. 16 through 17, tilde out. Of course, as always, we see the nice correspondence here. And then H arrow R, the box above it, goes from 15 to 18 
and it was using the rule arrow in. Nice correspondence again. And finally, what's the justification for 20? Well, remember lines 14 and 19. Those are the two things we penciled in for two lines for double arrow. Now they exist. So we're going to use our double arrow in rule as our justification. And it'll just be 14, comma, 19, and the name of the rule, double arrow in. And we're done. In most respects, I'd like to say this is an especially difficult proof. You just follow the method, it gets itself done. But I promised that I would come back and point out that there's a shortcut that you could take. This contradiction showed up after line 10. It turns out that whenever you have a contradiction that shows up in your proof, there is sort of a shortcut that you could take. It turns out that in logic, from a contradiction, anything follows. Now, this isn't the space to go into details about why that works, but if you have a contradiction, there's a way to cheat. So let's say that I had gotten to my contradiction, and I'll kind of just rewrite the important things here. Tilde j on 5, and then on line 10, I have j. And as soon as I see that, I could say, hey, I'm just going to make a box and assume the opposite of my conclusion regardless of whatever it is. I'm going to make a PA for tilde out and just assume the opposite of the whole thing. This has nothing to do with its being a double arrow. This is just a trick that you can use. It's not something you have to know. But, if I assume the opposite of tilde r arrow h, all I have to do is insert the contradiction that I already have, j and tilde j, and call this 5, 10, ampersand in, and now, voila, I'm done. 11 through 12, tilde out. So, here's a 13-line version of the thing that took us 20 lines doing it in the standard route. Again, you don't need to know this particular contradiction shortcut, but it's kind of cool and in certain cases it'll save yourself it'll save you some work.